And it is now uh, with great pleasure that I would like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. I'm just going to unshare his, my screen because uh, Christian will you share his screen uh, shortly. So let me just do that. Yeah, it is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce you to uh, Christian Chris, all the way from Roland Berger uh, Consultancy in Germany. The consultancy itself is based in Düsseldorf, uh, near a city I used to live, very close to Dortmund. And uh, he's actually joining us tonight from Essen. And uh, when I looked at uh, potential participants uh, for the World in 2050 series, this was a no-brainer. Roland Berger Consultancy have done a huge amount of work on the World in 2050 and their compendium, covering all aspects of 2050. And, you know, some of the talks we had already, they have covered off as well. And actually, they have done so much work in this area that another speaker from Roland Berger will join us in two weeks' time to talk about innovation and technology. But, Chris, but Christian has been instrumental in, in communicating the Roland Berger Compendium, uh, sharing its findings, sharing its thoughts, and discussing uh, the potential outcomes of some of the predictions and trends that we are seeing uh, in the compendium. Uh, and I will hand over to Christian. I will just leave one quick thought with you, is that the reason why we chose the world in 2050, and I'm sure Christian will mention this as well, is the future in 2050 is not far away. In fact, the, the future in 2050 is already in the making as we speak. So that's why we chose a period of time, which is 27 years, which is basically just a generation away. And some of the things that are already on the way will significantly inform how the world will turn out in 2050. And more importantly, the role we can all play, each of us, to actually shaping that future. So without further ado, please welcome Christian Chris. Thank you very much, Andreas, and uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here about uh, mega trends. Maybe some additional words uh, about uh, my person, uh, some uh, Andreas already did. I'm with Roland Berger for really a long time, a very long time for a consultancy. I started in 1996 with Roland Berger. And, uh, I studied as a researcher there, I did then a PhD uh, uh, in the PhD program of Roland Berger. And afterwards, I joined the RBI, the think tank of Roland Berger, which is responsible for macroeconomics, for trend research, and uh, also for scenario planning. So I, I, I do these uh, things for uh, a relatively long time. And uh, we started with the trend compendium in 2007 together with the um, young global leaders from the World Economic uh, Forum. And uh, there uh, it, it was then at this time, the Trend Compendium 2030. And uh, now we are in the sixth edition. And uh, since some editions, uh, as uh, Andreas already mentioned, we, we have now the horizon 2050 because, uh, okay, it's 27 years, but uh, it's nearer than, than some people think. Now I will share my screen. So as, as I said, uh, the Trend Compendium is a global trend study uh, compiled by, by our think tank, Roland Berger Institute. And uh, we have two different kinds of uh, versions of the Trend Compendium. We have a compact version, which uh, uh, includes all six mega trends. And this compact version, we just have um, uh, we, uh, one moment, I will change the slideshow into the theater mode, so you can see it better here. Um, we, we have just uh, uh, up, uh, updated and revised the, the compact version, which includes all the six uh, mega trends. And in the second half of uh, this year, we will uh, update and revise the full versions. So these are um, presentations about each mega trend more in detail than the compact version. You will find all these information on our website. Just go to warrenberger.com and, and type in Trend Compendium 2050, and you will find the, the PDFs of the Trend Compendium. And if you have any questions regarding megatrends also after my presentation, then just come back to me. 
Okay, as I said, the trend compendium uh, includes um, uh, six mega trends. Uh, when I had a look into the history of, of the development of the mega trends, here one can see that it is relatively stable because we are um, concentrating on really long term trends, which are not so, uh, so uh, volatile like other trends. And so, for example, the population development or climate change and pollution, all these things are more or less long-term trends. <clears throat> and as and Andreas mentioned, in uh, two weeks, uh, my colleague David Born will talk about uh, mega trend number five, technology and innovation. And I today will talk about the mega trend number two, politics and governance. And to make it more uh, <clears throat> structural, we have uh, structured all these trends into different subtrends, three or, or four subtrends, respectively. And politics and governance is structured into three uh, subtrends global risks, geopolitics, and the future of democracy. So let's go into detail. Mega trend number two politics and governance. This is a combination, this presentation of um, uh, the renewed um, compact version I mentioned and uh, from the current uh, full version, which uh, I updated slide-wise. So let's start with this trend. And here you, you can see we have the three mega trends, global risk, geopolitics, and the future of democracy. Let's start with global risk. In, in this section, uh, you see the top 20 global risks on a 10-year horizon. Uh, this is based by um, uh, a survey from the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum does two different surveys. Uh, first of all, it makes a survey regarding a long-term horizon, a 10-year horizon regarding a global risk. And the second uh, horizon is a short-term horizon, one to two years. We here uh, choose the World Economic Forum because it is a standard uh, uh, reference regarding global risk. And in all uh, uh, other trends and mega and, and sub trends, we always try to use uh, public available sources. So we use sources from the IMF, we use sources from uh, OECD, like here World Economic Forum, we use uh, the UN or World Bank, whatever, so that the reader can easily find more information at public available sources. So what can we see here? The top 20 global risks on a longer horizon, on a 10 year horizon. We see that there is a, a focus on environmental risks. The top four uh, risks are environmental risks. The top two regarding climate change, then it comes about natural disasters. And number four is about biodiversity. And there is even uh, there are even two more in the top 10 regarding natural resource crisis at number six and uh, at number 10 large-scale environmental damage incidents. Uh, you see at, at the bottom that uh, the risks are uh, structured regarding different um, uh, kind of, um, uh, of risks. We have economic risks, environmental, geopolitical, societal and technological risks. And uh, as I said, here in, in, the, in the top line, we have the most uh, environmental risks more uh, from 10 to 20. You see other risks. Uh, some risks are from the technological side, some risks are from the geopolitical side, and some also from the geoeconomic uh, side. When we go into the short-term risks, we see a very different picture then. Here is a, a, the, the survey, the results from the survey uh, regarding short-term risks, but when uh, the World Economic Forum does this survey, they always ask decision makers from politics, uh, from um, organizations, from uh, the economy and uh, NGOs, whatever. And here in, in this uh, section, you see that the risks in the short term are very different from country to country. You see here the 12th uh, biggest country regarding GDP, with the exception of Russia. Russia was not included in the survey, so it's not included here. And you see that here, uh, not the environmental uh, risks are dominating, but uh, more economic and geopolitical risks. 
that's, uh, that's uh, quite interesting, um, but maybe uh, <laughs> you, you would say, okay, that, that's, that, that's clear because uh, of the uh, uh, one side of the um, geoeconomic confrontation between the US and China and between the US, uh, uh, between China and Europe, and uh, also because of the strong geopolitical tensions between many countries and also, of course, because of the uh, war in the Ukraine. When we go uh, a little bit deeper in, uh, in the risks uh, regarding the long-term horizon, then let's have a look into the climate change risks. What we see here is an analysis uh, by an insurance by Swiss Re uh, about uh, the economic impact of uh, different temperature rises until uh, 2048. And uh, what we can see here that even if we reach the Paris target to be below the two uh, degrees Celsius increase, that the world would have um, uh, <clears throat> minus 4% impact on the GDP in total. And if we have a, a much stronger increase, then you see uh, if we would have, for example, a 3.2 uh, degrees Celsius increase, then we have really a, a very, very huge impact on the world GDP, we would lie, uh, then be at minus 18%. When we look at natural catastrophes, here is an example from the US, weather and climate disasters in the US from the uh, last uh, uh, four decades, then you see that it is clear and upward a trend. We have more uh, number of events per annum we have uh, higher costs and we have also more number of deaths per annum. What you can see here are um, disasters, the overall damages or costs which all exceeded more than 1 billion US dollar. So a clear upward trend here. On the other side, uh, regarding biodiversity, one can see that um, the, uh, <coughs> Here, the ecosystem services are really uh, very, very valuable for the for the world and for, really for the for the whole economy and for the GDP. In total, as you can see on the right uh, uh, side, it is estimated that the global economic value of biodiversity and ecosystem services is more than 1.5 times than the global GDP. Here in this table, you see the monetary values uh, per hectare, per inter international dollar per hectare, and he's, you see that uh, particularly coral reefs and coastal wetlands are very valuable per hectare uh, um, uh, regarding the ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are, for example, provisioning services to deliver or provide food and water, to provide raw materials, uh, to provide genetic uh, resources, um, then, then, of course, regulatory services, so um, like air quality regulation, climate regulation, um, waste treat, uh, uh, regulation, treatment, erosion prevention, and so on. You see that, that uh, coral reefs by far uh, atop the marine uh, regarding their uh, value per hectare, but of course uh, the marine uh, has, has a lot uh, more uh, far uh, bigger area. The same goes for the forest and, and, and for woodlands and uh, for other areas. So in total, again, it's uh, uh, 1.5 times really a huge mess. Okay, uh, we, we saw uh, previously that um, on, on the previous charts that uh, we have also other risks and environmental risks. Geoeconomic confrontation and interstate conflicts are really also very risk, uh, uh, risky in, in the future. And, and uh, we also see in the current uh, state that we have a lot of ongoing conflicts. We have wars in the, uh, in the world. We have a lot of uh, civil wars. Um, we have many, many uh, areas where 
there is a political instability. We have uh, terrorism uh, transnationally and, and also uh, religious wise. So a lot of ongoing conflicts, which are also very risky for the development of the, yeah, of, of the mankind and also of the societies and the economy of the world. I will just uh, uh, show you two examples of conflicts. One example is the transboundary conflict between uh, Egypt and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is, is currently building a, a grand uh, a dam, the grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance dam. And uh, Egypt on the other side is very much dependent on water from the Nile. And uh, so 90% uh, of, of the water uh, is, is, uh, of Egypt is dependent from the Nile. And what would be possible impact of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam? It, uh, during its fill, it would uh, um, lead to a 25 re percentage reduction of the Nile water flow to Egypt. And it would also uh, uh, lead to a 30% reduction of the energy production of the Aswan High Dam. And that's the reason why Egypt and Ethiopia are in uh, strong negotiations about how to fill this dam, whether it is uh, uh, really possible to fill it in five to seven years, or whether this uh, uh, should be prolonged to a longer period. Another interesting area, which is uh, uh, which can also raise a lot of conflicts, is the Arctic Sea. The Arctic Sea is very uh, uh, impacted by climate change. And uh, a recent study said that in 2030, in the summer, uh, most of the area of the Arctic Sea will be ice free. And that has uh, important uh, impacts, uh, uh, particularly that there will be uh, new routes for trade, particularly the, the Northern uh, Sea Route, which is quite interesting, not only for uh, countries which are directly located at, at the Arctic Sea, but also for a country like China. So China is also very interested to, to use uh, this uh, sea route, if it is possible, uh, to, uh, 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 to send their products to Europe then over the Arctic Sea. And uh, there is one organization which is called Arctic Council, uh, the member states of the Arctic Council are all the countries which are directly located in, in the, uh, to the Arctic Sea. And uh, the, the problem is that Russia is also part of the uh, Arctic Council. And uh, since the start of the Ukrainian war in the last year, uh, more or less the negotiations within the Arctic Council with Russia has, uh, uh, has paused. So there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, work in, in the Arctic Council between all the other members of the Arctic Council. But uh, as Russia has a long share of the Arctic Sea, um, it would be very important to, uh, to have Russia again on the table uh, regarding the Arctic Council. Okay, coming to the to the next uh, subject, which is uh, geopolitics and which is directly related to what I uh, told you before, all these conflicts and, and all, all the risks uh, lead now to a, a really a, a change of the global world order. We had a quite stable or although threatening uh, global world order up to the Second World War, we have the Cold War more or less, uh, as I said, a, a stable period uh, with, with uh, some uh, exceptions like the Cuba crisis. Then we had the, the collapse of the communism and, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And um, afterwards, more or less a time of relatively good international cooperation. We saw it, for example, in the um, global financial crisis 2008-2009 that the G20 uh, uh, yeah, very closely worked uh, together to solve the problems of the financial crisis. But then more or less uh, uh, five or, or, or seven years later, 
uh, many tensions uh, uh, increased. Um, it started maybe with this tensions uh, between the US uh, and, and China when, uh, when Trump became president. Uh, but that was not, not the only uh, tension. There were all, also tensions between China and, and, uh, and the EU. There was a Russian uh, annexation of, uh, of the Crimea. And uh, finally, there was a war uh, which Russia started in, in the Ukraine in the last year. So we really now have a, a very different uh, picture of the global world order like it was 10 years or 20 years ago. And uh, we tried to put this into, uh, into scenarios with two different axes, as you can see here. Uh, one of the axes, uh, the, the x-axis is uh, geopolitics, where we have the poles cooperation and coexistence on the one side and on the other side confrontation. And uh, the y-axis is uh, about world trade, where we have globalized interdependent value chains, or uh, on the other side, localized and decoupled value chains. And as I said, when we uh, look back to the global financial crisis, we are more or less, uh, we were then in the, um, uh, in the corner uh, left, on the left side, in the bottom corner on the left side. So we, are, we had a competitive multilateralism, more or less a good um, uh, and close collaboration between countries, even between countries with, our, with uh, very different uh, systems. And globalization continued more or less until 2020, 2015, and uh, as uh, Andreas mentioned, you already heard about uh, economic development, then I can imagine uh, that you already uh, have heard about the term globalization. So, so that globalization is stalling uh, since, uh, I would say, yeah, uh, about eight years. Uh, you can see it when you compare the growth rates of uh, trade, uh, world trade, and uh, world GDP. And in former times, uh, world, the growth rates of world trade always uh, were much higher than the growth rates of world GDP. Normally, uh, uh, they were two times higher than the growth rates of uh, world GDP. But uh, about yes, since, since about the global financial crisis, or some years after, you can uh, see that uh, the growth rates are more or less the same. So there, uh, 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 there is no uh, diminishing, or, 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 or uh, uh, how can I say, it? there is a little bit uh, a slowing of globalization uh, regard uh, trade-wise. Uh, uh, it, is, it is not a way, the globalization, of course, that, that, that's clear. Uh, but you can see it also if you uh, have a look on, on, the, on the value chains. Uh, you always uh, hear uh, 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 things about nearshoring, about um, uh, regional uh, shoring, and 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 uh, uh, something like this. And this is really ongoing. You can see it in the data. So we are more or less a little bit um, uh, shifting regarding trade uh, 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 to the localized and decoupled value chains, and regarding geopolitics, of course, yeah. You can see uh, more or less uh, a similar uh, development that we uh, yeah, shift from cooperation and coexistence more or less to, to a little bit more confrontation. Uh, for example, when you have a look at the China strategy of the EU, uh, they state that China is, uh, is a partner and at the same time it is a competitor and a, a systemic rival. And, uh, the German government uh, this week uh, also published their uh, China strategy and uh, they, they use more or less the same uh, terms and they say, okay, uh, we shift a little bit more from uh, that China is a partner of us to China is uh, more a, a competitor or more a rival. It's, uh, they try to avoid uh, 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 words about uh, a complete decoupling, but uh, the risking is always said about uh, relationships uh, to China. So we are more or less shifting from a world of competitive multilateralism to
to a world of uh, rivalrous multipolarity, where it uh, really in, in the end uh, will, will, will end to whether it will be an uh, isolationism, uh, what we here see, or neo-imperialism or hegemonial rivalry. Nobody knows exactly, but what is more or less clear is uh, that, that, that the times of, of this competitive multilateralism are at least for the next years over. We, we can see it also in, uh, in the military spendings. Here you, you can see data about uh, military expenditures in 2010 and 2022 uh, for, for the biggest uh, spenders, the, the top 10 uh, countries. And you can see, of course, that the US is still the, uh, by far the, 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 the biggest in, uh, uh, military uh, spender. They have the highest military expenditures. But you can also see that uh, countries like China or also Russia and India, Saudi Arabia are uh, catching up. And China has more than doubled uh, his, uh, its um, uh, military expenditures since 2010. Russia has more than by more than 50% uh, uh, increased and uh, India also, Saudi Arabia, uh, I think it's, it's uh, something like 30%. And you see also here the, the biggest armies in the world uh, uh, have China and India. China, by the way, also has the biggest uh, marine, of, of, although uh, the US is, I would say, uh, still the strongest, uh, has the strongest navy and is, is, is the strongest uh, 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 sea nation but uh, China has uh, the most uh, marine vessels in the world. And not only the military expenditure, uh, you can see an increase. What we can also see an increase is about uh, trade interventions. Here's a number of harmful and liberalizing trade interventions. Both are increasing, but the harmful trade interventions have much more increased and they uh, top the liberalizing uh, uh, trade interventions by far. So in, in, in 2010, if you compare it with 2023, uh, uh, this year, then you see that really uh, protectionism has very, very much uh, increased. And uh, you see it also by very bold acts like the US Inflation Reduction Act uh, or, or other acts, uh, which are really strategically uh, uh, done. And uh, yeah, and in, in, in total, they increase these uh, trade uh, tensions. There are, of course, also some uh, uh, hints that uh, regional trade might might be a, a little bit closer. Uh, for example, there is this uh, 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 trade agreement RCEP, where, where China is is uh, is part of it, and many Asian countries. Um, but in total, you can say, okay, protectionism is also underway. Yeah, we, we, we saw here uh, a lot of uh, signs of uh, confrontations, um, but it, normally instead of confrontation, the world would need really more cooperation, uh, uh, especially to achieve the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, the SDGs 2030. I think you all are aware of these uh, 17 uh, goals. Uh, they have been uh, uh, invited in, I think, 2015. So. Now we uh, are at, at a point that is more or less half time. And uh, if you see here uh, the results so far achieved, then you see a lot of uh, red, which makes uh, 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 regarding the SDGs, which means that major challenges remain. And there are only uh, a few green circles, which means that, that uh, the SDG has already uh, achieved and uh, also, if, if you uh, look at the arrows, there are uh, a lot of arrows where, where uh, the, there is a decrease or a stagnating uh, 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 efforts for achievement and uh, very few um, green where we are on track. If you are more interested in this, I can really very much uh, recommend uh, the new World Atlas from the World uh, Bank. Uh, 
which gives you a very detailed overview and then with this very, very nice uh, uh, graphics, interactive graphics about the current status of the, uh, of the SDGs. Uh, it's really worth to, to have a look in, into this. Yeah, and uh, regarding international cooperation, I, I will give some more uh, fields. I will not go into details in, into these fields, but some more fields show showing whether uh, on which um, international cooperation really is needed. The first field here is uh, space operations. Um, by the way, here's in the space operations, the ISS, the International Space Station, is uh, more or less the only, uh, 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 yeah, the, 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 the only um, uh, thing where the Russians and, and the United States are working very closely together. Um, interestingly, China is not part of the ISS. So that was a decision by, uh, I think, by, by the US that they uh, didn't want to have the, uh, China uh, within the ISS because of uh, uh, the know-how transfer, which, which would then uh, be necessary. Uh, but China, of course, uh, has more or less his, his own uh, space station uh, now. Uh, yeah, and then here, international cooperation would be really uh, helpful. There is, of course, cooperation, for example, between the ESA and the NASA and between other organizations, but there is a lot of cooperation missing. And uh, that would be very necessary, for example, to, uh, to use the problem of space debris. There's a lot of space debris from old satellites and, and, and other things in the, uh, in the space. Well, here's a, a number mentioned, more than 30,000 pieces, but these are only the biggest uh, pieces. There are even more uh, in, in, the, uh, in the space. And it is really needed to, to take care of it. And uh, it is also needed to take care of other things in the space, like satellites and, and uh, light pollution by satellites and, and, and so on. Another field would be tax governance uh, for multinationals. As you can see here, uh, uh, selected OECD countries and their tax rates in the year 2000 and 2021, you see that, that there, uh, there has been a decrease. In, in each country, and also you can see that there are very different um, uh, tax rates in different OECD countries. And uh, uh, to avoid or, or to limit uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, competition for, for the country which uh, uh, has, the, has the best taxes, international cooperation would be really, really needed. In 2021, there was a G20 uh, uh, leaders meeting, which uh, at least endorsed the implementation of a 15% global minimum tax for multinational enterprises. That was a first a step, but this is really uh, not enough. It's, uh, there really has to be done more. AI regulation, we, we, uh, we, we still mentioned it, it, it in the poll, is another area. There's a lot of efforts uh, ongoing in different uh, countries and areas uh, in the EU, for example, but also uh, China has, has, uh, has, has done uh, some uh, legal requirements and, and uh, regarding AI, the US uh, uh, the same. But what is missing here again is international uh, cooperation between uh, the different uh, countries. And uh, as one can imagine, <laughs> uh, uh, at the moment, the confrontation between the, the different blocks and countries is so high that it will be really a challenge to have a global AI regulation. Yeah, another field would be uh, uh, ODAs, Official Development Assistance. You see here the Net Official Development Assistance uh, grants for in, in the year 2020. You see the, the biggest spenders. Uh, uh, very uh, high differences between uh, these uh, spenders. And uh, in the second uh, graphics, you see that only Germany and UK in the year 2020 uh, reached the UN target of 0.7% of gross national income uh, ODA spending. So also here, international cooperation would be really um, helpful. 
And, and, and the last field is uh, cybersecurity, uh, maybe even the most difficult uh, field because uh, many cyber attacks uh, come from countries like uh, uh, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, as you see in, in the pie chart. And the cyber attacks uh, really have in very, very uh, much increased uh, since 2005. And uh, if, if there would be any uh, agreement uh, regarding cyber attacks, uh, there could be a lot of money saved. Yeah, coming to the uh, to the third uh, subtrend, that's about future of democracy. Uh, the University of Gothenburg um, regularly uh, uh, looks at countries and uh, categorizes uh, countries into four different categories, uh, from liberal democracies uh, uh, over electoral democracies, and, and then uh, to electoral autocracies and to closed autocracies. The differences are, uh, of course, as you can think, that liberal democracies are the most uh, democratic uh, countries. Uh, electoral democracies are uh, systems where you have a, a, a certain institutional features, the guarantee of, of free and fair elections and the freedom of association and freedom of expression. Um, and the autocracies, are, of course, uh, lack of, of uh, a lot of these uh, features or of the features at all. And what you can see here in the, uh, in the line uh, charts is that since 1972, first of all, there was an encouraging uh, development that you see that the number of close autocracies, for example, uh, very much decreased uh, from uh, the, the 70s to the year 1998 or, or 2000, uh, something like that. But when you have a closer look at the most uh, recent developments, uh, then you, you see that the number of liberal democracies uh, decreased, and at the same time, the number of closed autocracies uh, increased. So, uh, yeah, really a, a, a little bit, um, an, um, uh, yeah, a dangerous uh, evolution, I, I would say. Uh, and you, you can see, uh, dangerous uh, uh, autocracy uh, developments, um, even in EU uh, democracies like Hungary or Poland, or to take, for example, uh, the, the planned uh, reform of the justice system in, in Israel. So there are certain uh, developments which are really uh, critical for the uh, evolution of the democracy. And in the democracies itself, there, there is another uh, yeah, threatening uh, development. Uh, on the left side, you see that the dissatisfaction with democracy in uh, 77 democracies has strongly increased since the year 2005. In the year 2005, about 40% of the, uh, of, of, of the um, participants uh, were dissatisfied with democracy and now we are at about 60%. Of course, you have a lot of differences between different countries. As you can see on the right uh, bar chart, there uh, are countries like Sweden where really the most uh, are satisfied with the democracy, but there are also countries with, uh, like Spain where uh, uh, only one third is uh, satisfied with uh, the democracy in the country and more than two thirds are not satisfied. But what is also um, um, yeah, really a problem is the next slide. Here you can see the global satisfaction with democracy by generation, generational cohort and age. And you see four different cohorts of generations. You see the interwar generation. These are uh, people born between 1918 and 1943. See the baby boomers, a very big uh, uh, cohort, born between 1944 and 1964. Then Generation X, uh, 1965 to 1980, and the millennials, born from 1981 to 1996. And you can see that the satisfaction with democracy is uh, very much more pronounced at the interwar generation and the baby boomers than at the Generation X and at the Millennials. 
and, and in addition, uh, uh, you see when when the people from the generation X uh, 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 <coughs> are getting uh, older, that uh, the satisfaction with democracy then even decreases. So really, here we uh, I think politicians have really a problem to convince uh, younger people about uh, um, more democracy and about the advantages of, of democracy against other systems. And, and I, I, I very briefly uh, already mentioned uh, early warning signs of autocratic tendencies, uh, like you, you can see in, in, in Hungary or in, in Poland, or, or maybe it's now also in, in Israel. Uh, you, you see a low commitment to the democratic process, for example, in, in, in the uh, participation in, in, in votes, so we will see uh, it later. Uh, you see a demonization of political opponents by, by, by the governments. You see an encouragement of political violence. It, it is not re rejected, the use of force, and uh, we have a willingness to ask for armed forces. You see disrespect for fundamental minority rights that, that you really can, uh, can see now, now in, uh, in, 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 in countries like Russia or Belarus or, or other countries in, in, the, in, in the East, but not, not, not only uh, uh, European countries apart from the EU or UK or other countries, but also in, in, the, in the EU, this is uh, partly discussed in, in, in some countries. Yeah, here, here is a, a poll uh, regarding uh, the political system, and uh, this is directly the, uh, related to one of the questions of our poll, uh, whether the political system needs to be completely reformed, whether it needs major changes or minor changes, or, or whether it doesn't need to be changed. And these are all democracies here. And uh, as you can see, in a lot of democracies, many, many people say it's, the system needs to be completely reformed. And, and uh, if you add uh, the number of people who say uh, uh, there are major changes needed, that then you really uh, are at uh, percentages of 80 to 90 percent. That's really incredible. Of course, there are also some countries where uh, the people say there are only minor changes needed or it, uh, the system doesn't need to be changed at all, like, like, like Sweden or, or Netherlands, New Zealand. But I think uh, this is really also an alarming signal, uh, yeah, not, not, not only for politicians, but for the whole uh, society uh, to, to convince really people about the uh, advantages of, of their democratic system. And uh, what I mentioned two uh, or three slides before, um, the participation in votes is decreasing since decades. You can see it here. Here uh, it's, it, 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 it was uh, uh, here, I, I think, for many, many country, uh, democratic countries countries uh, with the exception of countries with, uh, 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 with compulsory voting law, of course. And you can see that this is a decreasing trend. One interesting fact about this, uh, the presidential election in the United States uh, in, in, in uh, the last presidential election in uh, 2020, um, the, uh, there you had uh, the highest vote uh, the participation, I think it was 66%, and that was the highest participation in all elections in uh, the United States at, at the federal uh, level uh, since 1900. That, that, that's quite interesting. I think that the, the reason was uh, this uh, extreme polarization between Biden and, and Trump, that this level was so high, but uh, of course it, it, it was then, then 66%, but this is also only two thirds of, of the, of the uh, voting population. All right, uh, I had a lot of negative 
uh, and pessimistic uh, uh, information, I think. Uh, so I will end with an optimistic chart. Um, at least what we can see now is uh, that a lot of democracy leaders try to uh, close their ties together. We, 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 we see or, or we saw that um, uh, Sweden and uh, Finland uh, uh, have become or will become new members of NATO. And we, we, we see that uh, the, the NATO is, is really strengthened uh, 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 also since the start of the Ukrainian war, of course, and that the US and, and EU have come much closer together. They uh, were very uh, close together uh, regarding the sanctions, for example, uh, uh, against uh, Russia, but not only uh, this, uh, they really uh, hold, uh, uh, I would say, um, yeah, the, 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 the values of democracy, they, they keep it high. And um, uh, yeah, together, uh, of course, here with, with, with the Ukraine, who fight for democracy, uh, also for Europe, I would say, and, and also for, for, for the US. So this might be uh, um, yeah, even one optimistic uh, aspect. Although it is stemming also from this, uh, yeah, very pessimistic uh, uh, or, or dark uh, outlook uh, for the future regarding politics and governments. That was my f uh, my last uh, uh, um, chart, content-wise, and uh, at the very last, I want to show the team behind the trend compendium. Apart from me, it's uh, David Born who will present uh, the trends about technology and innovation in two weeks and uh, my colleague Stefan Gehring and uh, we have been also um, um, supported by, by, by some interns and uh, as I mentioned what what we really uh, very much use is our public available sources and we uh, mostly use desk research but we also uh, of course uh, talk with a lot of people inside and outside of Roland Berger. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And, and now I'm really very, very happy uh, to, to hear about uh, uh, your uh, uh, thoughts uh, about uh, this topic and your questions, of course, uh, whatever you can ask, whatever you like. And if you have questions afterwards, uh, after this, uh, this event, you can uh, also uh, send me an email or, or call me. I'm happy to uh, answer these questions. Okay, thank you very much. Christian, thank you very, very much for a action-packed presentation of all the different dimensions regarding politics um, and governance. And uh, clearly, it may not seem particularly positive all the time, but I think it's nice that you finished on a on a positive slide. <laughs> and I'm, I was delighted to find myself in Generation X. I was looking for myself in uh, baby boomers. So I was delighted. I, I'm actually a Generation Xer. Uh, before we get on to the Q&A session, and thank you very much, Christian, once again, uh, shall we do the poll one more time and see whether people have changed their mind? So let me just uh, share the screen. Oh, doesn't want to share. There we go. Let's just go back. Right. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay, here we go. So the first question was the most important world issue to resolve by 2050 is climate change, world peace, governing AI, or poverty. Please vote no. Okay, we've got quite a few on now, nine people or so. World peace, climate change, 18 now voting, poverty. Interesting. I think that's not... Oh, oh world peace is making a, a, f a comeback. So I think, I, think yeah. that's, I think that's definitely different. 
uh, to what we had before. So I think whilst climate change is, is critical, and you told us about uh, biodiversity, you know, in financial terms, uh, being one and a half times more valuable than global GDP. Yeah. In world peace, given what you've talked about, the geopolitical issues, uh, seems to have raised uh, more issues this time. So let's go to the next question. I think that's about 22 people have voted. It's a relatively stable. So let's track on with the next question. In 2050, the world will be less democratic or more democratic? Thank God it's not, it didn't stay at 100% less democratic. So 81%. So I think uh, you've, you've sold us a very sober story, Christian. <laughs> I think that was slightly more balanced uh, last time. And I think uh, three, more than three quarters think the world is going to be less democratic, particularly worrying when actually the younger generation in the West also believe that uh, uh, democracy has to be uh, reformed uh, to a large extent. So again, lots of food for thought. And then finally, the next question, the final question, by 2050, politics needs to be completely reformed, needs major changes, needs minor changes, or will roughly stay the same after you've, so please vote now. Okay, we've got nine, 15 people contributing now. Okay. I think we leave it there. So I think that is that is pretty conclusive. So again, I think you've done a good job, Christian, for showing us what needs to change. We now come on to the Q&A session. I, I can see there's quite a few things going on in the chat room, but I think it would be nice to, to start in the room. I think the other thing to mention is because, because there was so much on the slides, I will send out the slides to everybody who actually booked a ticket tonight. So you can actually digest all of this at your own leisure. But I think it's extremely useful information because it's basically collating it from all the reputable sources like the IMF, the OECD, etc. So I think it will definitely be a useful insight. Okay, who would like to ask a question in the room? The gentleman over there. Directly. Hello, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm particularly interested in this idea of dissatisfaction with democracy, particularly among younger people. Uh, not least, of course, dissatisfaction, to my mind at least, can range from, you know, perhaps outright rejection to um, a sort of a, a dissatisfaction in a more mild sense to just with the present system. So I'm intrigued with this decrease in of faith in younger generations. Do you think that is indicative of a, an actual turning away from democracy by younger people in the West? Or is it more of a, a protest reaction to the status quo and the way that things are presently structured? Um. To be honest, I, I, uh, I cannot uh, answer this uh, exactly, uh, um, but, but, I, but I would say um, both, both is right. What I would be interested in and, and I cannot answer is uh, what is voting participation of, uh, of younger people? That, that would really uh, interest me and uh, that, that would, in my opinion, be, uh, be a sign are they interested in, in uh, really participating in, in democracy or are they not? If you uh, have a look um, at uh, the use of social media, for example, to express their minds, then, then you see really uh, they, they do it and, and uh, uh, they, they uh, sometimes do it really very bold. Uh, but but uh, but what I really miss a little bit, and that might be a, 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 um, really a task for education, is to, to come back to the, uh, to the values which you see in, in the constitutions of, of, uh, of, of our countries or of, of, the, of democracies, the democratic countries, of, of course, or of the EU, and, and uh, see really the values they have now. They can freely express their opinions. They, 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 they can vote, they cannot vote. 
they have the right to, to vote uh, uh, to uh, whomever they want. They can actively be a part of, 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 of politics. And uh, normally, I, I, I would say, uh, when, you, when you have uh, also the, the look in, into other states, and uh, they should be informed about uh, other countries where people cannot express uh, their, uh, their minds and, and, and there is no free press and uh, there is a uh, uh, suppression of, of many, many uh, things, uh, then they should uh, uh, say, okay, our democracy has an enormous value. But uh, yeah, so, so, so I, I, I cannot, I, I think that there is a lot of, a lot, a lot of protest, but uh, when I think about my country, Germany, I would say um, the, the protest uh, voters are not uh, only the, the young uh, people, but uh, the protest voters uh, also come uh, partly from uh, 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 really for, for also from the older ones. But, uh, th that might be a specific problem in Germany, in an in East and West problem. In East Germany, we, we really have a lot of people, um, which is, in my view, not understandable, but, but uh, which uh, uh, are very critical to our democracy although they came from a more or less auto autocracy in, in the GDR. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that there are really some strange developments um, which are not so easy to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to explain. But, but in my opinion, the most important thing is really education. So education in the school and also in the family and uh, what is a little bit missing, uh, and, 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 and then I stop, <laughs> uh, is uh, unfortunately uh, the information of the young generation from, from filtered sources, so from newspapers. Who uh, reads a newspaper who is 15 years old or 18 years old? They don't read newspapers. They, 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 they um, uh, get the information from, uh, from TikTok or, or from, from other sources in the internet, but they hold the information or, or they, they, uh, from, from sources they always use. So they are really then in, in such a filter bubble. And here I, I see really a problem. And I see the task of, of, um, of a school or of the schools um, to, to really um, uh, yeah, educate, uh, educate uh, the, the people about um, getting a broad picture of information. Okay, thank you, Christian. We've got another question in the room, but it's interesting that Greece, the foundation of democracy in ancient Greece, they don't like it much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think they didn't like it much at the time either. So I think uh, at least they're being consistent, whereas uh, people in Sweden and in New Zealand seem to be quite happy with, uh, with uh, carrying on uh, as before. And even Winston Churchill famously said, democracy is a terrible thing to do, apart from all the other ways of governing that we've tried before. So I think there may be, maybe it will come up in the discussion later, whether actually democracy is seen as the default position from which to proceed towards 2050, or whether people are actively looking at alternatives. But before we answer that, I'll just pass you over to another question from the audience. Thank you very much for the richness of ideas. I was in Albania when the first democratic um, um, election took place and the opposition weren't attending um, uh, the first parliamentary session because they'd lost. It seems that a uh, basis for democracy is an acceptance that uh, the uh, the result of a democratic election could be accepted by the minority. I'm concerned that in the United States, for example, analyzed by Jared Diamond, who writes on these things, the uh, two parties aren't speaking to one another and are acting for the good of their country. Um, you use the word democracy very often in your talk. It seems that a democr dem democracy is a process rather than a given 
uh, uh, standard, could you define your understanding of democracy? Yes, uh, 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 thank you for, for the question. You, you are absolutely right that democracy is, is, a, is a process. It, it, it is not, um, uh, not, not a status, uh, yeah. Uh, my definition would be that, that uh, democracy really uh, includes uh, several rights you, you, you cannot, uh, that, that are not debatable in, in, in my opinion. So, so, so the right to vote, the right to uh, freely uh, speech, the right for the press to to, to receive information and and, and to uh, to inform uh, to inform people, um, the the um, also of, of course which is which is in, in my opinion very important, uh, the, the um, that you are protected by a system uh, for for violation. So, so, so that uh, uh, that um, you you are have really institutions that uh, that protect you from others who wants to violate you, and then that you can um, uh, um, have, have legal uh, uh, rights uh, that you can enforce in institutions. So, so uh, what what we call in Germany the Rechtsstaat. Uh, um, then that, that is really a fundamental in, in my opinion for, uh, for for democracy and and you are absolutely right regarding your observations uh, uh, in, in the US uh, that, that's that's really uh, also threatening and, and dangerous in, in my opinion that you have this polarization in the US and uh, nobody of, of the two uh, uh, um, um, of uh, um, um, different, uh, yeah, how, how can I say, the, the different uh, um, uh, 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 people talk with, with each other. They, they, they are so uh, confronted to, to each other and, and that's really, really, really a problem. And uh, you, you see it in many other uh, democracies uh, as well. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, Germany, you, you, you see, uh, uh, it in Germany also, you, you, you see the, the upcoming uh, of, of the right uh, wing party, AFD, in, in, in Germany. And uh, normally you, you, can, you cannot talk to, to these people because they have their opinion and they, uh, uh, you, you cannot convince them with arguments. It's, it's really crazy. Okay, thank you for that. And it's also interesting that the world's largest democracy the United States of America is only run by two parties. <laughs> Should be food for thought. It's not too dissimilar in the UK either. Okay. Um, by the way, everybody online, if you want to unmute and show your, show your video, you can ask questions directly of Christian. I'm just going to unspotlight him, and then that should be possible. But are there any more uh, questions in, in the room? There's a lady over there. Okay. Could you pass that on? I was very grateful for all the data, but one thing I really wondered about, how can you put, or how did one put a dollar value on, for example, coral reefs and wetlands? That really knocked me for six. So if you could explain that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, to be honest, I, I, I cannot explain it to you. I know, I know the article from which uh, it is, and it is, it is really extremely uh, complicated. It, it is an, a very, very complicated model. But, but if you come back uh, to me or, or via Andreas, uh, then, then I can provide you uh, some information uh, in an email or, or, or we, we have a chat or, or a phone call, whatever, uh, but, but uh, it, 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 it is really very, very um, uh, uh, difficult because you not only have uh, different, uh, different ecosystems, you also have so many different provisioning services from, uh, from medical service, from tourism, 
from uh, 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 protection of erosion uh, 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 to so many different things. And on all these, you need to put a, a, a dollar tag. And uh, that, that's really difficult. And of course, this makes also the model uh, um, um, maybe a little bit doubtful, uh, of, of course. But uh, in the end, I think most important is that uh, there is really a, a huge uh, uh, amount of, of value what we have in, in, the, in the biodiversity. Uh, uh, what can be measured, for, for example, I'll give you one example of what can be measured is um, what would be uh, the loss if we don't have the bees uh, for, for pollination. Then that, that you really can measure uh, 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 that, that you have uh, really less, less output uh, in the in agriculture, or for example, CO2 sequestration by whales or, or by, by krill or, or other, uh, 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 other animals that you can really measure. But of course, other things are really very, very uh, difficult to measure. And, uh, but but uh, nevertheless, I, I, I have uh, um, the PDF and, and the article on hand and I can send it afterwards to you. Thank you for that, Christian. I, th I think just to add to that, I think if you want to have another perspective on this, then obviously the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report shows what the, the environmental impacts are on the loss of biodiversity. I think this is quite useful, though, to actually to make policy makers, not the scientists, but the policy makers aware that you are actually destroying something that is worth, worth more than the global income in the world is actually should raise some alarms. So actually quantifying is, is probably not a bad thing. I think you need to do it in conjunction with all the other measures and say, look, we are, we, are, we are destroying the planet here and we need to do something about it, I suppose. Okay, th that's great. Anybody else in the room? Because otherwise, can you, does anybody want to unmute? Uh, Michael is there. Let me just change the view uh, a second. One second to gallery. Mm -hmm. And then, Michael, you are now. Do you want to ask a question? You're just on mute at the moment, I think. Yes, I'm unmuted, I think. Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You can hear me. Good. Um, we, we didn't cover the um, trends in the standard of living um, and education. Both of those items would seem to favour the democratic prospect. And I'm wondering whether, in fact, there were, in that context, some potential game changers, such as, for example, in China, where the autocratic regime at some future point may collapse and that China may become a more democratic country. Because the Chinese, I think, are naturally democratic, as they've demonstrated in Hong Kong. And I'd be much more confident about that prospect in India than in China. But, uh, but my question is, um, in that context, what is the prospect for a game changer such as that one? Maybe, uh, may, maybe two, uh, two answers to this would be uh, a, a little bit to touch uh, your points, uh, education and then the standard of living. Uh, in the S in the SDGs, no, no, not we, but but uh, I, I, I showed you the sustainable development goals, and and there uh, are uh, the standard of living and and also the educational goals. Uh, we have to look uh, then uh, very stand there. But I would completely agree that standard of living, for example, is for example related with with uh, 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 with your meaning about uh, democracy. Because, as you can see, the, 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 the more or less the richest countries uh, uh, have a more positive uh, stance uh, regarding democracy than, than other countries. Uh, th then your question about China. Very good question. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that whether uh, um, more education uh, would be a game changer here because a lot of people in China are, are very good educated uh, at the moment, or already very good ed educated, but they don't have any doubt about uh, the system. They have a good living standard, and uh, they are, well, 
uh, most of them are, are maybe satisfied with, with, with the system and, and with the development uh, in China. You mentioned Hong Kong. It's okay. It's another uh, case. They had democracy before uh, they, they, they came to, uh, to China. Uh, and, and maybe there is uh, uh, really in their experience uh, this, uh, this experience of democracy and, 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 and they know it. Uh, okay, the younger people might only be told about it, but uh, th that might also be a, a effect. Uh, so I think the uh, situation is a little bit different in uh, Hong Kong and in, the, in mainland uh, China. I, I don't know whether it, it can be a, a game changer uh, because many Chinese, they, they can travel, they, they can travel all over the world and they came back to China and normally one would say, okay, yeah, now they have seen the democracy and, and they will maybe that they will push them for democracy in their own country. But so far, uh, th th there is no, there are no many movements uh, seen, I would say. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And I suppose you need to look at the country's history to, to see how likely democracy is, is something on the, on the horizon. Uh, Duncan. Alsop, you've also unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? Yes, I, I posted this one. Um, I'm just interested in the discrepancies, the large discrepancies that uh, your graphs showed in with uh, satisfaction or, or dissatisfaction with democracy uh, between, uh, it's almost bimodal, between young, two younger groups of, uh, uh, of uh, people and two older groups. And I, I wonder if the, uh, to what extent is, is this dissatisfaction of the two younger age groups uh, with this uh, democracy uh, uh, reflecting different political priorities? For example, one might expect, expect younger uh, uh, generations uh, to be in favor of more radical action uh, for mitigating, halting, or reversing climate change, whereas older generations are, are uh, find changing away from a, a, a gas and uh, oil-based uh, uh, economy uh, rather more frightening from the point of view. They're getting old, they want transport, they want to heat their homes. Uh, I, I just wonder if, uh, what are the, uh, What's fueling it, really? I mean, America's a different case because of the polarization there. I mean, to some extent, Europe is also becoming uh, more polarized, but it, not in the, the shrill uh, and, uh, well, the violent uh, uh, way America is. I mean, the, the, uh, the murderous riots on, on Capitol Hill when Trump refused to, uh, to, to, to uh, stand down. Okay, you might need to rephrase the question in one sentence, Duncan, to, to give okay. Christian a chance. What, what, is, what is fueling this uh, dissatisfaction of the two younger age groups? I mean, it... yeah, uh, 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 I think one of the reasons is that, that, that the, the speed of uh, change the younger people accept is, is not enough. I, I, I think that they, they see the, uh, the politicians in, in their uh, countries always talking about uh, climate change and, and we will do so, so many things. And uh, in my opinion, as you see the radicality of, 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 of these uh, younger, of some of the younger groups, uh, I think it's, uh, they, they really uh, say, okay, the, the, the speed is not, is not enough. You have to move really much, 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 much quicker. And, and uh, I think they are frustrated and uh, that that's in my opinion that, that's the reason for the radical action and that might also the reason why they are so dissatisfied with the democracy okay we've got a few questions online does anybody else have a question in the room uh, maybe one of the last questions in the room before we go to online no nobody has got a question so we'll we'll finish off with a couple of questions in the room. Does anybody want to, uh, to show the video and, and ask a question directly or should I read them out of the chat room? I don't think anybody has, and let me just double check whether they've unmuted themselves or not. 
No. So we'll go to the chat room instead. Um, Trevor asks, there's no mention of inequality, political or financial, as a problem to be solved, as a political problem to be solved. Uh, why was that not in your presentation? Yeah, it, it, it was slightly touched uh, within the SDGs. In the SDGs, uh, I think one of the first uh, SDG is uh, 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 eradicating poverty or, uh, or, or, or eradicating inequality. And uh, then that's, of course, very, very important. Uh, as we discussed, uh, uh, equality or, or inequality is also uh, important for uh, what you are thinking about democracy, uh, I would say. Uh, but we go more in detail in this uh, full version. This, this is uh, only a, a glimpse, uh, and, and, and uh, most of the slides are, are from the compact uh, version. So we will go deeper into detail. But of course, inequality is is really a, a, a problem. Yeah, and and you saw the topic of uh, ODAs, official development assistance. They exist since uh, decades. And there is a lot of uh, money flown in uh, in emerging and, and developing countries, but uh, without so many uh, uh, effects, I, I would say inequality is still existing in, in, in the countries. Although, but I have to say, I, I, I saw the, uh, uh, and I mentioned the World Atlas from the World uh, uh, Bank uh, regarding uh, what the status now is regarding the uh, SDGs and for example, uh, the share of poverty has strongly decreased since uh, uh, since the last years. So there is uh, a certain progress, but of course uh, not enough. Okay. And, and then another question is, what work have you done in terms of different generations' positivity towards the future, which you would then be able to use to correlate some of the questions around democracy against etc.? Yeah, uh, uh, very good questions. Uh, here, here come, come, for example, programs in my mind with which uh, uh, brings students uh, uh, together, like Erasmus or, or something like this, so, so that you exchange and learn from, from uh, other countries' experiences. But, but of course, you have to do a lot in your own country to, to convince uh, uh, younger people about democracy. And again, here we are at education. And, and so, in, in my opinion, really to educate the, the youngest uh, people about the advantages and the value of democracy is so important. Okay, thank you. And then one final question just popped up on the screen. Uh, so I'll ask it, does populism erode democracy? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Well, that's a good and short answer, this year. <laughs> and a very short and good question. So. So uh, we'll draw things to a conclusion now in terms of the question and answer session, but please put your hands together for Christian Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. So, so before we go, I've just got a couple of very brief announcements and that is uh, you've five, five talks have been completed now in the World in 2050 series. We have got three more to go. Uh, next Friday, we have uh, Eliza Lanzi from the OECD uh, beaming into the room like Christian did from uh, Paris to talk about uh, in global environmental challenges, in particular pollution. So that will be very informative. So that's next Friday. The following Friday, as Christian had already mentioned, We've got David Bourne coming back from Roland Berger to talk about technology and innovation and the impact that will have by 2050. So that's on the uh, 28th. And then on the 4th of August, we draw the symposium or the, the series of talks to a conclusion with a talk by John, Professor John Lennox from the University of Oxford, who will give a talk about artificial intelligence and the future for humanity. And that will then conclude the, the series, but a few of the speakers have already contacted me to see whether we could do a plenary session, sometimes in the autumn, where they all come back and have a big discussion forum that actually brings all of this together and people can ask all sorts of questions. 
because I know there were a couple of questions today about why didn't we mention climate change specifically. That was already in the in the uh, in the third talk and will be obviously in, in next week's talk. So I hope you're going to stay tuned for that. I hope to see you next Friday. In the meantime, have a, a pleasant and safe journey home. Bye bye, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.